Hello, welcome to Time Capsules. I'm Carl Qualls, professor of history at Dickinson College. We've constructed this video series to illuminate some moments in European history. For my students, this series serves as a backdrop to our class discussions, but all viewers are welcome, and we hope that you too will enjoy unearthing the past. Since 1945, Europe and the world have been free of large-scale warfare that plagued the first half of the 20th century. Unlike after the First World War, peace treaties were far less punitive, and the United States participated in international bodies. But even as transnational partnerships increased, the world increasingly became divided between the two superpowers that emerged from World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union. Did these two great powers and the ever-increasing capacity to destroy each other and the planet with nuclear weapons prevent warfare and competition? Or did the nature of conflict merely change form? Please join me for this time capsule on the Cold War. Scholars debate the starting date for the Cold War, but most located between 1946 and 1948. There were a series of wartime conferences between the big three World War II allies of Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union, in which the war and the post-war world were discussed, but no one envisioned the way that the Cold War would unravel. The Tehran Conference finally led the Western Allies to open a front in France to aid the Soviet Union, which was bearing the brunt of the Nazi military. The Yalta Conference outlined new borders for post-war Germany, planned to demilitarize and divide Germany into several zones, and committed the Soviets to war with Japan once Germany surrendered. What would become the Nuremberg Trials for Nazi war criminals was laid out at Yalta also. The Potsdam Conference further confirmed discussion started at Yalta and added the deportation of Germans from Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. It was at Potsdam that the Allies divided Vietnam into two parts, setting up a Cold War hotspot two decades later. So in the waning years of the war, there was dialogue between the Soviet Union and the United States. Agreements were not always easy to reach and relationships not particularly close at times. But soon after the war, a series of Cold War policies and institutions were established that changed the face of international politics. The Truman Doctrine promised U.S. military and economic aid to Greece and Turkey to contain the spread of Soviet influence. Truman said, It must be the policy of the United States to support free people who are resisting attempted subjugation. In short, Truman established U.S. foreign policy for the rest of the century. The United States would do everything possible, whether legal or not, to halt the advance of communism. The Marshall Plan, named for President Truman's Secretary of State George Marshall, is usually known for the $12 billion, or $120 billion today, given to restore 18 Western European economies. But the plan also set the foundation for European economic integration by modernizing industry and removing trade barriers. NATO was the final piece of Truman's anti-communist policies. NATO was and is the premier collective defense alliance, designed to combat the spread of communism and now as a bulwark against Russia. Article 5 of the treaty requires all members to support any member nation that is attacked. With the Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan, and NATO, President Truman built a political, economic, and military coalition to battle communism in Europe. But it was the start of the Korean War, which first brought NATO into action and deepened hostilities with the Soviets. Stalin established a common form to coordinate policies among communist parties across the globe. This was a direct response to the Marshall Plan, which the Soviet Union kept out of Eastern European countries. Comic-Con was a response to Western European economic coordination more generally. When in 1955 NATO added West Germany, the Soviet Union responded with the Warsaw Pact, forming a military collective security bloc among the Soviet Union and its Eastern European allies. As the name suggests, the Cold War was a period in which the two superpowers did not directly enter into a hot war. That does not mean, however, that there was no conflict. Let me give you a few examples of where U.S. and Soviet interests collided. First, the Berlin blockade. Many scholars point to this event as the start of the Cold War. When the Western Allies introduced a single West German currency, the Soviet Union blocked all rail and road access to West Berlin. For nearly 11 months, the Western Allies daily shipped nearly 9,000 tons of food, fuel, and other necessities into West Berlin until the Soviets finally lifted the blockade. During a three-year Chinese Civil War, Mao Zedong's Soviet-backed communists fought the United States-supported nationalists of Chiang Kai-shek. With U.S. protection, Chiang fled to Taiwan whose place within China is still contested today. The Soviets liberated North Korea from Japan at the end of World War II. The United States then quickly moved into Southern Korea to block the Soviets. By 1948, the peninsula was officially divided. 
Two years later, the North invaded the South. China and the Soviet Union supported the North, while the United States led the UN forces in the South. In the summer of 1953, an armistice, but not a peace treaty, was signed. We are still living with the demilitarized zone and hostility created near the beginning of the Cold War. In 1961, the Cold War returned to Berlin in what is known as the Berlin Crisis. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev again demanded the Western powers demilitarize West Berlin. Meanwhile, East Germany was trying to stop the flight of its population to Allied territories. Overnight, about 32,000 East German troops sealed borders and began construction of the Berlin Wall, which stood until 1989, the symbolic year of the end of the Cold War. Also in 1961, John F. Kennedy and Fidel Castro faced off during the Bay of Pigs debacle, and a year later in the Cuban Missile Crisis. In 1961, the CIA failed miserably in its attempt to overthrow Castro. This dramatically worsened U.S. relations with Cuba and drove it even closer to the Soviet Union. Khrushchev and Castro agreed to put Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba to prevent further U.S. harassment of the island nation. After a tense 13-day standoff, Khrushchev finally agreed to withdraw if the U.S. guaranteed not to invade Cuba and promised to remove Jupiter missiles from Turkey and Italy. This event was the closest we came to full-scale nuclear war. Now, the Vietnam War. In order to unify the country, North Vietnam, supported by the Soviet Union and China, invaded the South, allied with France and the United States. The United States entered as part of its policy of containment of communism started by the Truman Doctrine many years before. Because of the fear of direct confrontation between two nuclear powers, proxy wars and covert operations were the preferred method of establishing geopolitical dominance. Unfortunately, this left much of the developing world after the Cold War highly fragmented and heavily armed by the Soviet and American military-industrial complexes. Let's look at just a few examples from the U.S. side, while recognizing that the Soviet Union was involved on the other side. In 1953, the CIA overthrew the democratically elected Iranian Prime Minister. The next year, President Eisenhower's CIA ousted the Guatemalan president and installed a military junta. In 1961, Congo's first elected leader, Patrice Lumumba, was deposed and executed. British, Belgian, and American officials wanted him dead, as they feared that Congolese uranium might find its way to the Soviet Union. The CIA was arming Lumumba's opponents, but it remains unclear precisely who was responsible for his murder. In 1973, a CIA-backed military coup toppled the Chilean president and replaced him with a military dictator, whose regime murdered thousands and tortured tens of thousands as U.S. banks laundered his money and the U.S. government supported him for nearly two decades. Time doesn't permit a full retelling of the numerous illegal activities of President Ronald Reagan and his administration. One of the most egregious is known as the Iran-Contra scandal, in which Reagan, the CIA, and the National Security Council sold weapons to Iran, then an enemy of the United States, and against which the United States had an embargo, in return for releasing hostages. The profits from these sales were to be sent to anti-communist rebels known as Contras to overthrow the Nicaraguan government. We will never know exactly what happened because Reagan's administration destroyed the evidence. Still, courts convicted 11 people, but President George H.W. Bush pardoned every single one. In all these countries with exes, the two superpowers were using rebel groups to topple governments. When thinking of these countries today, what comes to mind for nearly all of them? If you said instability, violence, or poverty, those are good answers. Much of their ongoing dysfunction is a legacy of Cold War interference and or Western imperialism. In Afghanistan, the United States and Soviets deposed leaders, propped up their puppets, armed rebels, and died in the thousands trying to control the country. The United States was so convinced that it needed to depose the pro-Soviet government that it trained and equipped numerous rebel groups who, like Osama bin Laden, turned their guns on the United States once the Soviet forces withdrew in 1989. In short, Soviet desires to spread communism and American foisting of capitalist democracies on other countries led the superpowers to arm and train rebels to overthrow governments. Factionalized and heavily armed groups in these countries have crippled much of the developing world. The Cold War might be over, but the damage will persist for generations, and superpower interference has created more enemies than friends. Giant militaries and caches of nuclear weapons kept the two nations from all-out war against each other, but at what cost to other countries around the world and to their own citizens who wasted millions of dollars on weapons rather than schools, roads, and hospitals?